several questions. I think I will read some. Some of the questions I think are in the category of clarifications or very brief answers. The first one, I think Dr. Taylor may have already addressed that. And the, the question is where did you get data about the rankings of uh, schools that yield the most PhDs? Okay, I think I'm, I hope I'm on. Yes, you could go to the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics. It's NSF document 21-321 and go to table 7-7. It will list the top baccalaureate institutions of Black or African American SE doctorate recipients by type of institution 2015 to 2019. I repeat this NC National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics, NSF 21 321. That's the document number, I mean, the, the publication number, and the table number is 7 7. I'll, I'll put in the chat the top 10 producers as of these data, as of, as of 2019. Okay. Thank you so very much. Uh, and the data set that you mentioned, it's, it's really a wonderful data set. We in CEOs use uh, those data sets very often. So thank you so much for pointing that out. The second question is, reads like this. Per capita, how does this success Rates, PhDs and MDs, PhDs in STEM uh, leadership positions, plus national credibility, for example, invited service on national STEM advisory councils of one, graduates from UMBC Mayerhoff Scholars Program compared with the success rates, uh, plus national cre uh, credibility, uh, for example, invited service on national STEM advisory boards, and two, graduates from the STEM programs of HBCUs and or HSIs. Uh, I, I would invite the three speakers, if they, if they can, to, addre to address this question. Let's start with uh, Dr. Taylor. Uh, I, as, a, as a quick follow-up to the last the first question, as I'm looking at the data in front of me, I'm trying to get it such that I can put it in chat. The number one producer, predominantly white institution that produces African-Americans who later get PhDs in the United States, it's not Harvard, it's not Stanford, it's not MIT, it's the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. more than even the, main, the flagship in College Park. Who's the president? Uh -huh. Freeman Hrabowski. <laughs> so that, that's something about the leader that sets a tone, that sets a culture that we don't, we, we can't, if we can't dismiss that. Just want to comment on that. And in that top 10, Maryland, Baltimore County is number one among HBC, uh, PWIs and fourth in the country. So. Oh. Jose, are you? Uh, yeah, I mean, how about the other speakers? Can you share? Yeah, some? So, so give me in, 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 in 15 words, what is it that you want to be answered? Okay, just repeat that. What, what, just guess, summarize what you, want, what you want to be answered. The question is how do we uh, assess the success rates of the PhD uh, programs uh, from individuals you know, that come from programs such as the one at UMBC versus other national programs? Yeah, well, I, I think that we look at individual cases and see how it's happened. You know, just following in, in the, you know, my critical ways of things and I do. But at, at Rice, uh, I produced probably in, in mathematical sciences, I've had 16 women PhD students and I've had six, no, 15, underrepresented minority PhD students who mm -hmm. have gone off to be faculty at tier one schools. One of my minority students um, last year, I nominated and he's a member of National Academy of Engineering, okay? So mm -hmm. I think we have to look at the individual cases and see how are you doing that? Yeah. But I would tell you right now, I don't think any mathematical sciences person has produced more women or more minority PhDs 
that I have. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that rice is perfect, and I'm not saying that tier one schools are perfect, but I'm saying that I produce people that have gone off into their careers and have become national leaders mm -hmm. in the profession. And, and uh, I'm very happy about that. And, and the same with, with the women. Now, what, um, you know, just to, to further, you know, aggravate the people and, uh, you know, pass my talk is that if you get a PhD, here's what in my book I say, I don't think that there is one PhD from a minority serving institution who is on the faculty of a tier one school in STEM, okay? So in other words, we're very elitist on how we hire people. I mean, we're, we're going through hiring right now. Right now, if I look at the hiring pool, in fact, I had to interview a candidate just a little while ago. Our pool is probably 75% Chinese nationals, okay? So in the pool of 300 students, you know, we had one, um, no, two underrepresented minorities that we had to look at very closely. But what I'm saying is this, this here's a hard statement. I don't believe that there is a PhD from a minority serving institution who is on the faculty tenure track at a tier one school. We're too elitist in the way we pick. And there's more to it than that. I can just say that. But you know, these are hard data points to look at, okay? But I, I've tried really hard to find such an entity. Okay. Now I'm not against HBCUs, and I think that there's a lot of things that they do extremely well, and there's a lot of things that majority of universities don't do well. But I look at this. I look bottom at line. Tell me how many people. Like we just had some data from Orlando. Tell me how many individuals have gotten their PhD at an HBCU or at a Hispanic serving institution, and are tenure track faculty at a tier one school. And the answer is zero. Hmm. Okay. I mean, that's a hard thing to say. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, when I was young, I used to say it. And now that I'm old, I still say it. But Richard, I think, I think that's the wrong question. So you're focusing only on PhD production in terms of judging the quality of the education required of the students. Students have to start off with an undergraduate education before they get into a doctoral program. So the question becomes, what kind of foundations are built in institutions that lead them onward to the PhD? And if you ask that question, you get a different answer, not the ones that produce PhDs. Of course, more PhDs are produced by dominant white institutions because they have more of them are from PhDs. That's the wrong question. No, no, I mean, that's the question that I decided to answer, Orlando. Now, you know, you have your question because it's gonna be supported by your data. And, and uh, but I understand what you're saying, but you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll even aggravate the situation by saying that of most of the minority PhDs that we produce here at Rice, okay, uh, most of them have come as Rice undergraduates, okay, so in other words, they move in from undergraduates into graduate school. We haven't had the success that you want or that, you, that you're, uh, you know, you're, you're proposing that we say. Now, granted, sure, there are uh, students that, um, come from HBCUs or especially and or Hispanic serving institutions okay mm -hmm. that's 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 one question okay but I'm uh, I'm willing to stand up with you Orlando and say <laughs> that, that the, 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 the students that you know a lot of the minority students that we have produced as PhDs at rice were undergraduates at rice mm -hmm. Can I ask a slightly different well, question? Rice, by the way, Rice does not appear in the top 50 producer of African-American undergraduates to get PhD. So Rice is not a player on a numerical number, on a quantitative number of producing okay. African-Americans in STEM. Now, let me tell you this, okay? Or, I, you I, have, but not the institution. Yeah, yeah, look, look, Orlando. Rice, in terms of undergraduate population, okay, is 10% African-American, Rice is, okay? That puts us number one, among all AAU tier one universities in the United States. Number two is Georgia Tech, okay? At 10%, Rice is number one in the production of undergraduates, and this is African-American undergraduates among all AAU tier one schools, okay? And where my criticism goes to the administration 
is that while we've done a great job in Texas of producing African Americans, we haven't done the same thing with the Hispanic situation. Okay, and that's that's where I'm the pain right now to the president. Yeah, uh, Cliff. Yeah, I'd like to ask a um, slightly different uh, um, version of the question, and and that is, um, are we able to measure? And and I don't think we are yet. So we should measure added value. Because we we should uh, we should identify. Um, what the institution is able to contribute, that is uh, the product going out um, um, much stronger than, than you might have predicted um, from all of the, uh, uh, all of the, the, the background and, and information of, of the product coming in. And, and I think that uh, that's something that is more challenging Absolutely. but it's something that, uh, that I would certainly like to know. Where are the places where you go where, where you really get yeah. You, you really get a kick and uh, oh, um, that, uh, that, that you you uh, um, your, your your expectations or I mean your, your outcomes are are higher than might have been expected. Cliff, that's very good. I want to quote a dear friend of mine that um, I've known for a long time, and that's Shirley Malcolm. Shirley Malcolm at the National Science Board used to say this. Okay, we value what we measure because we don't know how to measure what we value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're here. Okay, well, on that note, let's move on to the next question. But I want to uh, uh, also mention something along the lines of what Dr. Taylor said. Uh, uh, in, in the year 2019, the National Academy of Sciences uh, published a report, which is titled this status of the minority seven institutions in the United States. And in that report, it is indicated that a very high percentage of underrepresented uh, students who later join the STEM workforce are trained at those institutions. Very, very important statistic there. So the next question is for Dr. Tapia. And the question reads like this. Dr. Tapia makes an important point about senior leaders of color, not only representing themselves as content experts, but also dedicated individuals to diversity, equity, inclusion, and uh, belonging, and requiring a host of organiz uh, organization to recognize our intersected identities. Research is clear that the success of these efforts are tethered to if, when, and how an institution's leader presents their understanding and commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. So this is uh, to Dr. Tapia. All right, so, so again, okay, I, I, I heard what you said, but tell me again in simple words, because you know, I'm a mathematician. I don't have an English major. <laughs> Uh, what is it that you want me to comment on? Um, I, I, I suppose that uh, here the, the idea is that you want to express the success uh, of these efforts, you know, like the ones we are discussing here today. How, and I think you in your presentation alluded to that to some extent, you know, as to how we measure the su success of these efforts that we are all embark on, at least the audience that we have here today. Mm -hmm. Well, I still don't really understand what I'm supposed to say, but like, let me tell this. We do need, you know, to focus on the full spectrum of students. I mean, it's the country that we're worried about. It's the country that we're worried about. It's not one school or one group or anything. In other words, and I always argue that underrepresentation, okay, is not to support the discipline. It's not that civil engineering is in trouble or math is in trouble. It's that the country is in, tr in trouble. So I say that underrepresentation should be something that we take care of to improve the health of the nation. No country can be so, um, no country can stay healthy with such a large part of its population outside of mainstream backbone activities. Science and engineering is a backbone activity of this country. And if we're not there, then we're not in the leadership and in the, yeah. uh, the part of the country. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's, it's really working together. I don't want to separate. I mean, but, you know, but I've, all my life, I've heard people hit at places, you know, you know and, and in particular, 
at the way I view things. But I've been re I don't think anybody in the country has been more successful than I have in producing, you know, programs. Okay, the AGAP program, which won an award. Okay, our programs, many of them, okay, you know, they, they win awards. And we're still continuing to do that. So I want it to be an integrated effort across the whole country, all people together. And how can we use, as Orlando says, mm -hmm. you know, the, the HBCU, uh, because they do some wonderful things. They, I mean, they really do some wonderful things. And it, it, so it isn't zero one. It, it's it's yeah. how do we put the whole yeah. spectrum together to work? Yeah. Yeah. And, and when I was on the National Science Board with my friend, um, Shirley Malcolm, we pointed out and learned that postdoc situation is particularly problematic, not just for minorities, is it problematic for everyone? Postdocs tend to be isolated and not integrated into the mainstream activity of the university yeah. or of the country. And so we need to work on that. And yeah. in an hour or so, I'm gonna give a presentation on how we're supposed to work with postdocs uh, in, a, in, a, in a, is a presentation to NSF. But yeah. anyway, yeah, it's a, it, it's a big yeah. group working together. Yeah, yeah. I'm finding myself agreeing with Richard here for a change <laughs> during this panel. Anyway, I've agreed with him most of the time. Anyway, but particularly well, during this panel, well, and, well, well, and, and, and the point is that the focus has got to, not to be on social justice, but on the on the welfare of the nation. Yeah. That's where we have to start. It, the, it's not a it's not a social justice argument. It's about the competitiveness of the United States as a nation. Yeah, yeah. Great, great Orlando. I mean, great. Yeah. Well, the, no, it, look, look, look at this. Look at this. Deal with this. <laughs> Our hiring committee right now is looking at applicants. Okay. And out of three hundred applicants, okay, seventy five percent or more are national Chinese. Seventy five percent or more. Okay, are national Chinese. I'm not talking about Asian Americans. I'm talking about national Chinese from very good schools. Yeah. All right, all right, well, all right. Well, good well, Orlando. On that note, let me just uh, uh, read the last question, which is addressed to Dr. Tapia. How do you suggest to uh, top institutions to create the necessary conditions for underrepresented students to go there, be successful, and thrive? It has to come top down. All my, here's the mistake. I made a lot of mistakes in my life, okay? I, I, I have. But the biggest mistake I made in my life is thinking that change can come bottom up, okay? It has to, buy-in has to be bottom up. Buy-in has to say the faculty really values it. And most people think that, uh, that, that faculty value, uh, you know, let, let's say uh, improving representation. But that's not high on their on, on their, their, their spectrum. I mean, what's high is for, is for research and, and various other things. So I made the mistake of thinking I could change the world bottom up. Okay. And if I, you know, and and so I didn't institutionalize things because I couldn't, because I wasn't in a position. If we don't get the presidents to buy in completely and say this is a part of what we should be doing for our country, as Orlando said a minute ago, we're gonna lose it. Okay. And so presidents, you know. They always have the same generic statements about how diversity is good and this is good and we're going to do this, but do they do meaningful things? And in my book, I have some suggestions on, on, on you know, I hit the president's hard on, on this issue. We have to start at the top. If you don't get support, you know, certainly faculty, I mean, it's a success to have the faculty because faculty essentially control graduate education and hiring okay so yes yes there is but you have to say when i'm doing these things i'm working towards better diversity better representation it's valued by the chair it's valued by the dean it's valued by the provost and it's valued by the president and valued in the sense that meaningful rewards okay and, and i think we've all done it and in fact i think cliff said this really good because, you know, we started out saying there's a big problem here and we have to do something to help, okay? And that's why I got into it. But I will say this to, to, to all of you, the delicate balance in my whole life has been trying to balance the outreach with the ingredients of, say, research that are rewarded. So my life has been balanced between good things that are not rewarded and 
research which is rewarded. That's the delicate balance. Okay, okay. And, and so many minorities in the early days in the 60s used to fall into that trap. And we had people, you know, who weren't getting tenure. And anyway, so yeah, I think they have to have the presidents do what Freeman Rabowski has done. Okay. I thank all the three presenters for this session. We are scheduled to have a 15 minute uh, break. Before we do so, I would like to invite Lydia uh, to give us any additional remarks or comments before we uh, reconvene for the second uh, session. I just want to second thanking all three of you for starting us off with a bang. That was a wonderful session yeah. and I look forward to more uh, to come. You know, another segment of higher education we rarely talk about in terms of, of um, making those numbers greater uh, is the community college sector, where almost 40% of all, maybe more, of all students of color who start off higher education careers are at community colleges. And we all know in many disciplines, if you don't start off with, say, good math, I can, um, this, is your, this is your case, Richard. Yeah, they ain't gonna never make it in physics, for example. Never. In Without fact, if you don't make it in high school, they ain't gonna make it. Orlando, you're you're right on. You're spot on. Now, one thing that you may not know is I am a graduate of a community college. There you go. <laughs> I didn't know that. Okay. <laughs> and and they they are big producers. Absolutely, so we, absolutely. Both my son and daughter went to community college. There you go. I have a quick comment for Dr. Tepe. I mean, I I, I thought you're. Your talk was very thought provoking. The only the only thing I'd like to to bring up is that um, you know there was a time when the yield of PhDs were mainly going into academic careers. The data today shows that you're looking at anywhere from fifteen to twenty five percent that are pursuing the kind of um, career paths that is emphasized by quite frankly the elitist and um, uh, 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 approaches. Uh, and exclusionary approaches that our top tier institutions make. So whereas I think that your point is very valid in terms of um, where those institutions get their own in terms of faculty and so forth, how does that play out to the other 75 to 85% of PhDs that pursue a variety of other careers that might not necessarily be as, um, as pedigree consumed as academic institutions oh. tend to be. <laughs> Look, the job market is incredibly tough. Okay, when I got my PhD in '68, and then I went to as a postdoc at the Math Research Center at Wisconsin. When after that postdoc, I had you know maybe 15 job offers from tier one. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure today if I'd get any job offers. Okay, I mean, <laughs> you know, I look at the applicant pool and the stuff, and I just go. Man, I'm glad I got my degree back in 68, okay, because I'm not sure I'd get a job today. So that the students are aware of that. The students know that how hard the job uh, uh, market is. But moreover, today, it, with, with respect to the uh, industry, you know, like when you say what Google is doing and what uh, Microsoft is doing, when other people, there's a lot of really exciting research and, and those positions are necessarily not subservient to the academic positions. And so a lot of students are going in good directions, okay? And then, you know, it used to be that you didn't go from, uh, an, uh, from an industrial job to an academic, but now <laughs> with uh, doing so much, it, 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 it's possible. But the students today are aware of the job market in academia, and it is incredible. And that's and, and the point. other challenge, of course, is that this changed a lot in the last 50 years is the increasing attraction to jobs in industry as opposed to academia. That's right. Whereas in the good old days, that was pretty much the destination everybody thought of. You go to a university, you get a degree from a first class place. I was a Michigan graduate. My thought was, you, of course, I was going to be a professor at another top tier institution. Today, many of those same students will want to go to industry. That is correct for various reasons. And, and, and for various reasons. Yeah. And, and yeah, I see that all the time. But what's happened is that at one time, you know, like, as you said, that we said, oh, yeah, the, the, the correct path and the the uh, the outstanding path I want to go is university. Then industry came in and played strong role. And then you said, oh, oh industry is good. Then industry went down. Now industry is back. 
Okay, so I mean, industry is <laughs> doing some really exciting things. Okay, and the question, I mean, the students that I working with, they tell me, I, I have people I won't name the companies who are working for them. They go, they're really tough on us. I mean, you think academia is tough? They're really tough on us. Okay. But we Cliff, need, did, you, we Cliff need, did you say you started at a community college too? Who me? Yeah, Cliff. Oh, Cliff. Uh, no, I didn't. I, I started uh, uh, the University of Buffalo as, uh, as an undergrad. Yeah. The best math professor I ever had was in the community college. And he told me, he, he pulled me aside and he said, here's what I want from you. And I said, well, let's go because I don't know where I'm going. Well, you know, that, that raises another issue is that many m mentors at research universities discourage their PhD graduates from assuming, for assuming a career in a community college. They feel that it's a waste of their time, that they did right. not, they're not producing folks to go to community colleges. And yet that's where significant numbers of the people are who need first class faculty to get them prepared to do further work. So we that's have a correct. dilemma here. That is, I have three women students who have PhDs who are in high school and they're really making a difference in, those, uh, in that high school community. And you know, so some people say, "Does that bother you that student A, B, C is in a, is teaching in a high school?" I go, "No, because no. they, they need understanding. They need. We don't need to le let you know the ed math education run the show. We need people with content knowledge. Okay, and I'm not saying that they're going to teach the content, but they're going to understand the whole situation. Look at Freeman Murbowski. Freeman is, doesn't do research, but he sure has a, a great PhD from University of Illinois. So at yeah, least in mathematics. And I know, I know. Yeah. And he and and um, David Blackwell also from Illinois. Yeah, yeah. And and so um, they understand a lot. I mean, you know, I'm going to give Freeman all the credit I can. Okay, he understands a lot, and he gives great talks. And uh, I haven't any lately. I haven't had fights with him, but I'm still waiting. <laughs> So Richard, that, that actually uh, also speaks to your comments uh, that you make often about credibility. You know, Freeman yeah. Freeman has the has the credibility, um, and starting out with that uh, uh, helped him uh, at least get into that position. Mm -hmm. Where, where then you know he brought his other, all his other talents to without to, a doubt to bear. See, look, when I get invitation to speak, okay, yeah, people know I'm controversial, but a lot of it are the credentials preceding me. Okay, they say, look. National Medal of Science. He, Tapia cannot be a complete turkey. Okay, and so I get these invitations. Anyway, yeah, you're right. You know, we we're all going to leave being loving each other. Okay, everybody love each other. That's where we start, Tapia. Yeah, <laughs> I, you know, the, I grew up not knowing how to use the word love. So I mean, when I say that, because uh, my, my mother was a very strong woman uh, who grew up, and I, I didn't know the word love. But today's world uses love a lot, so I'm learning. I mean, today, th that's my practice on using the word love, is that we have to love each other. Okay. Another factor in what all of you mentioned is that the, the Research One institutions in particular have been very slow to this show. And part of it is because of what you said, Richard, which is that while there might have been a little bit of activity at the bottom, there was very little at the top, and there were no incentives. That's sort of just now beginning. And it is just now occurring to a good many of these institutions that they're missing out when they don't have the domestic students uh, available. And summer programs have begun to help that. So that now the faculty are saying, oh, I want one of those guys, gals in my yeah. lab. And then they admit them to graduate school. So it's slow. And the-, the but, but, but you're right. I mean, it used to be white males were bad guys. Now they're good guys, okay? Because we, <laughs> and why are they good guys? Because we don't have them in our graduate programs. I love white males too. Hi, uh, th this is France. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi, France. Hi, I really enjoyed the last session. You all did just great. It was super interesting. And I'm looking forward to participating in the next, although I enjoy listening more than talking. So 
so your session was the highlight. I, I did want to uh, just, I had to jump in to comment on universities. So I'm, I'm a trustee at a, a university that is uh, traditionally very, uh, um, you know, white and male and uh, lots of uh, foreign students, and that's Caltech. And I see enormous changes going on there, just enormous. Uh, I don't have the statistics at hand to show you, but could get them. Uh, but they are really, really making uh, big strides towards uh, in, in diversity and inclusion. And they, they have uh, some wonderful leadership and starting with the president. And he has uh, some wonderful people working with him closely on this. And if anything, our board meetings, which are, as you can imagine, on a, a whole host of topics from technology transfer to student experience, et cetera, every, every meeting is permeated with DEI. And so, so things are, are changing. <laughs> I mean, yeah. for all of us, we've lived through a lot and this change is coming uh, late, but it is, uh, it, it, it is really happening. Thank you. And, and um, yes, I, I, I agree, but Caltech had such a long ways to go, okay? And, uh, and that's true. But one of the things that I say, France, to you is um, universities don't understand the difference between domestic born and raised and why it's important to represent have them represent in our country versus people who come from other countries yeah i saw and, that in in your remarks yeah and, I understand. and i make it big in my book so we'll see how the book goes i mean you know we'll see how the book goes because i hit hard okay i had to think about it because i've had people tell me no you shouldn't do that and i've had people tell me you should do it and then i told myself i should do it and so i did it and it's true under uh, when France was director, the last director, it was then because for a long time, a uh, number of us had been saying this on the CIOS committee that yeah. we needed to pull those numbers apart. And now the uh, the NSF is beginning to do that so that. The well, th thank goodness for CIOS. I mean, really. Uh you know, just um, uh, the, the the very best, I mean, all the committee, all the committees, all the children are beautiful, but uh, but CIOS did something extra special because it permeated very articulately um, what needed to be done through the whole agency, you know, not just a piece of it uh, and uh, in a very synthetic way. And we had just, you know, wonderful leadership on CIOS. That's I, good. I, I just, that yeah, I, I agree with that. Amen. So um, is France there? Yeah, France is okay. here. So France, I want to ask you a question. When you, when you started your lecture series at Purdue and a president's lecture series, and you invited me as the first speaker, did you have any pushback because I was underrepresented minority? No, no, I, I don't remember anything like that. Why do you ask? Because I'm interested in it. <laughs> That's a good response. Um, so no. Okay, fine. No, no, we were always in. In fact, uh, yeah, I was uh, just talking with my spouse about that, who of course remembers uh, you and your lecture and all very well. No, that it, that was um, uh, any pushback I got at Purdue was at me. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, from from alums who are used to a different looking model.